So we're celebrating 20 years of the Agile Manifesto with the Agile 20 Reflect Festival. And it's hosted by the Agile Business Consortium, the professional body for business agility. And I'm pleased to say today we're joined by Layla Rao. Layla is an enterprise lean agile consultant and co-founder of Lean and Agile. She's the creator of the Compass for Agility framework, which will be published in a book with the same title this fall. Uh, Layla has years of incredible experience with complex organizations as well as several United States government agencies and this session is on the promise and premise of agile and it's interactive so if you have questions just feel free to jump in and without further ado i will hand over to our host Layla. thank you so much jade so as jade mentioned this is designed to be an interactive session uh you will get a copy of the slides afterwards so i feel no pressure to read through all the slides or even walk through them. I really wanted to share what I see what's happening in our agile world these days because there's parts of it that I love and there's parts of it I'm like, oh, is this really what we're supposed to be? And so kind of sharing experiences, comparing what we're seeing, and then talking about how do we make it better? Because you know what we all tell our clients is don't just talk about the problems, talk about solutions. So I want to make sure that we are focusing on how we can do better because I do think there's so much, not just amazing people, but worthy ideas and values in the agile community that can be built upon and living up to the promise. So are we ready to start or are we waiting on anything? Jay? Yep, good to start if you are. All right. Okay, awesome. So let's see why my slides are not moving. There we go. Okay, so when I talk about the premise of Agile, kind of the basics of what everyone thinks Agile is, right? A way of working, group work, the general framework of we do things in a short time box, get things done. And I love this meme about where the stories are made up and the points don't matter, because I think that's a lot of what we're seeing in Agile. And if you ask most people, this is kind of what their impressions of Agile are, for better or for worse. And that is fine. I mean, it's a good premise, more effective teams, effective organizations doing work that matters, that's great. But I think for a lot of us, there is more to Agile than just this, the basics of it. And I'm calling this the promise. And this is what drew me to Agile. And yes, I love the collaboration, the way we work together, but it always meant something deeper. Agile is a way of recognizing us as human beings in the workplace. And, and beyond the workplace is how do we use what we know from Agile to change the world and to make it better for each other? And you know, that's a lot of what led us to start Lean and Agile, which is a way of taking all of these Agile approaches and amplifying it for women and girls across the world. But in terms of Lean or in terms of just work itself, I've always been drawn to the idea that Agile is really about making work work for people. And I want to make sure that we're hitting both of these concepts. So before I dive a little bit deeper, does this idea of the premise and promise resonate or am I on an island by myself, which is fine. Sometimes I do tend to get on my own little island. So does anybody have any thoughts they want to share about these two concepts and if it translates? Yeah, please feel free to can... unmute as well. I mean, for me, it definitely resonates and it's interesting because I'm quite new to Agile. I've probably only been involved in it for about a year. So I'm really interested to see how far it's come over the past 20 years. Yeah, for me, uh, to add, uh, my name is Ivo. Um, so, uh, yeah, because because so now I have some communication issue here, so I couldn't really hear the question, but I thought you were asking about how we how Agile is perceived. Yeah, that's fine. Is this idea of both Agile as a very, the way of working and as a bigger value system, did that resonate with you? Yeah, that uh, because that it's, <clears throat> it, it's a, for me, it's a practical way of working, but also it's a kind of a buzzword 
a lot of uh, uh, companies use to promote their own uh, companies, like, hey, I'm agile. So uh, that also means something, for example, uh, providing uh, more autonomy to, to the employers. So that's why what I see in the Netherlands. So they say, hey, work with us because we are agile and that meaning that you have uh, a lot of, uh, that you have more autonomy to decide on stuff. That's what they say. Wonderful. And please jump in at any time. I mean, this is designed to be interactive, but I'm gonna go ahead and start moving a little bit. So, okay. The way I define being good at the premise of Agile, which is more effective team, more effective work, is these four, I think, core principles. The first one is pretty obviously, Scrum is not Agile. And Scrum is fantastic. I've used it, I've worked with Scrum Master for years, but it is not the same. The two are not interchangeable. And a lot of the problems I think we see comes down to conflating the two. And the second principle is, if you're doing Agile in a workplace, it has to be invitation to a partnership. We can't come in saying, I'm the Agile expert. I have all the answers. Everyone follow me. We're going to be in heaven soon. Like, that's really not how to make this work for the people who are working in it. And the third principle for me is Agile is the how, not the why. We're not pursuing Agile for the sake of, oh, Agile is this heaven that we want to achieve. No, it, it, it's a way of working that allows us to achieve something that we care about. And that something is unique to every organization and every team. And that's something that we have to be able to do. If we can't talk about why or how Agile is delivering the values that matter to a group or a team, then we've lost them. And the fourth one, and my favorite, is the reality of human beings. So often we talk about Agile as frameworks and all these ways of working, and sometimes I think we lose track of, are we actually making it work for the people who are working in this? So I want to go into these four concepts in a little bit more detail and talk about why I think these are so essential to just fulfilling the fundamental premise of what Agile is supposed to be. So kind of obviously with Scrum, I came into Agile before the whole ecosystem got built. So sometimes it's a little amazing to realize, oh my God, there's all these experts and books and resources and 100 conferences. Because I can remember when there was nothing written about Agile. Most of us had to figure it out. Like, what is this? How do we do a retrospective? Now I can Google and come up with 100 templates. So one thing that I think kind of got lost a little bit is the core problem that Scrum was designed to solve, in my opinion, is decrease the cost of change in software development. If you did IT a software development before Agile, I was a VA. I wrote a 100-page design document that no one ever read. When I came into my first Scrum project, it was an amazing experience to realize I put down what I want, and then two, four weeks later, I get to see what that looks like in a software. That was revolutionary. And that's the problem that Scrum solves brilliantly. But not all the challenges we have can be solved by Scrum. And it's really important to acknowledge that, I think, because for all things Scrum does really well, it focuses on delivery. It assumes that somebody somewhere magically knows what we need to do, and we just have to do it well. And the longer I work, especially in complex organizations, the less true that is. There is no magic group that has the right knowledge, so we just apply from and we deliver the right things and the world gets better. It doesn't work that way. We have to really invest in the discovery, and that's not particularly well. It's not to say it can't. You obviously can use from to do the discovery. But the most standard applications I've seen focus on somebody else does the discovery of the backlog and we're simply going to ruin the backlog and keep turning things out. And another byproduct of this is the way we measure agile progress is being conflated with maturity and scrum practices as opposed to how well are we doing in solving the problems of this organization. How are we learning? Are we getting better enjoying our work? Because that matters. And so this is what I mean by really not conflating Scrum versus Agile. Otherwise, we'll all call the Scrum coaches and leave out the word Agile. And that's fine. That's what you need. But being very aware of the differences, 
because agile coaching requires a broader knowledge area than just Scrum. And one of the disservices we've done is our entry level certification for agile is a Scrum Master certification. Like how did we end up here? And then we promote Scrum Masters who also become product manager experts into agile coaching. And yes, I know there's a lot of certifications that kind of bridge the gap a little bit, but I do think that there is a fundamental flaw when our entry level certification into the agile ecosystem is based on one very specific framework, no matter how wonderful that framework is. So when I mentioned invitation to partnership, as Jay referenced in my introduction, my background is in lean. So long before I discovered agile, I was working in lean. And it's system thinking version of lean in healthcare, which really focuses on an ecosystem evolved the way it is for a particular purpose to meet some needs. If those needs have been overtaken by events, that's great, let's change it. But we have to honor what there is first. And because of working in healthcare, I mentally translated that to first do no harm because that's the golden rule of medicine. So when you're coming into an organization with a lean mindset, the first thing is to stop and look at what's happening. What is happening here? Why is this happening? How did we get here? What factors led to this? And one of my pet peeves is we have to be able to speak the language of the business we're in. We can't just talk about Agile Scrum. If you're new to Agile, the sheer amount of vocabulary that is Agile specific is a barrier to entry. And we use these words so automatically thinking they're universal. They're not. We're artificially setting up barriers and making our own job more difficult. So as you're following the, the lean principle, come in and listen. What are you trying to do here? What is the core job of your business? What is your value proposition? Can we articulate that? And then how does everybody fit into that value proposition? How does each group's work fit to achieve the organizational value? And if they don't know, that's kind of the conversation we need to be having. So let's have those conversations. And Agile is a vast ecosystem. Going back to the first point about if you're only looking at Scrum, then let's do Scrum. That becomes the only option you have. But if you're thinking about Agile, there's so many different techniques and tools that you can use. So make an invitation. And if you shift from Scrum to Agile, hopefully you're shifting from compliance as an implementation of Scrum to invitation of what Agile practices best fit this challenge and this scenario. Because compliance is a hard sell. Most people don't like being changed. And that's what compliance is. And it's usually not going to be enough to solve the problems in any complex or what I call emergent domain. Most organizations, what they need and what they do are constantly changing. New problems emerge. If you want to make Agile work in this group, it has to be not compliance, but an invitation. Let's look at all these options. Let me help you figure out which options are best suited here. And I typically try to do three new practices every quarter. Your mileage will vary, but for a big organization, three new practices is about what most groups can handle in 90 days. So we talked about the how and not why. 10 years ago, I was like, yes, we want Agile. And now it's becoming, oh, of course we want Agile. But no one actually talks about why. What are you using Agile to solve? And the way I try to talk about this is when I'm talking to a new client who wants an Agile transformation, I'm like, okay, great, let's do it. It's been two years, we've done this. What does it look like? What is your job like? How are you doing your job post Agile transformation? Because if there isn't a difference, then what? Are we simply relabeling people and relabeling processes? If it doesn't fundamentally change the way people work, then is it really an Agile transformation? Because there is no gold star for implementing all the Agile practices. And to make, to make a shift from how to why, to me what matters is how do we use the toolkit that is part of Agile to contribute so that every person has a sense of autonomy, mastery, and passion? And this goes back to Daniel Fink's theory of what motivates people. And if you can show how Agile connects to all of these concepts, then it should be more sticky. And the way I do it in my work is every week, 
I ask myself three questions. Is what I'm doing under the Agile umbrella, does it make people feel more valued? Does it make them feel like their work has value? That what they do is actually being used for some purpose, being used by people, it's making a difference. And are we having fun? If I can answer yes to all three of those, then we're on track with the engagement. Everything else will work itself out. And if I'm saying no to any of these, especially more than once, there's a problem. And we need to stop and talk about those things. So, for whatever reason, I'm having a hard time seeing, oh, there we go. Okay, having fun, yes, I'm seeing questions right now, okay. Yes, and all of this are so true with COVID, with remote working, because one of the things that's happening, I think, in my experience is, we're losing all the hallway conversations, what I call the connective tissue. Anyone know the operation game when you're a kid, where it's this board game where you're all different um, organs? And that's kind of what I feel like we're doing. We're talking about these different individual organs and losing track of the body. How do these things fit together? How does this impact the other? So whatever your version of these three questions are, I think it's worth checking in with yourself, with your transformation team, with the people that you're coaching and working with to see, are we still doing the why? Have we lost track of the why? And the fourth one, because that is my favorite, Agile has all these wonderful ideas and concepts, and sometimes we're running to the inconvenient reality of people and systems who don't do things the way we think they should be doing them. And sometimes it's frustrating, yes, but this is also where the value is, especially of coaching and facilitating and leading, because if it wasn't for this, people could simply buy their own books and do it themselves. I mean, it's not that hard. Agile itself, I mean, putting in these practices, not that hard. The challenge is making it work for people and systems, and that's where our value should be. So again, the way I think about it is, we were doing very compliance-based. This is the Nyberg checklist, which I should love, by the way. We go from there to more targeted, which best practices work. And then I'd love to go to cognitive. Is it working for the way people think? Is it resonating with them mentally? Our mental models are really challenging to connect with. If we can do that, if we can make whatever we're doing in the name of Agile work at a cognitive level, it's going to stick and it's going to change and it's going to move organizations in the world. But well, we have to get there. So the way I try to think about it again, lean concept, delighting workers more than delighting the customers. We want to feed our customers. I'm all for capitalism, it works, great. But unfettered capitalism, not so much. So to me, the best way to delight your customers is to delight your workers so that they will continue to delight your customers, whoever they happen to be. Customers are usually shorter-term engagements than workers. So invest in your long-term engagements. Make your transformations work for those who are doing the work. This is the best way to make it stick. And making it stick matters because we're spending a lot of money on agile transformation. And if it doesn't stick, that's a lot of money and people's time and talent and organizational capital that's been wasted. Okay, so if you're seeing Agile as basically team, more effective organization working, do these four concepts make sense? What's missing here? What else really needs to be present? Motivation to the team? Yes, and to me that goes back to the autonomy, passion, and mastery. At a broad level, most of us want to feel like we have control over our work. We want to feel like our work contributes to something bigger, and we want to be able to care about our work. So Eva is saying in the chat window, leadership. Absolutely, yes. And I'm going to be talking more about leadership going forward. Um, I work mostly in Washington, D.C. and New York City here in the U.S. So most of my clients are either government agencies or large organizations. And I have seen a significant shift in leadership, let's say, over the last 15 years. 15 years ago, very much of, yeah, I'm all for Agile. Make my teams do it. Now, it's their understanding Agile isn't just for teams. That they have to step in, be part of the process, 
they have to learn how to work in an agile way and be agile to make it stick. So I'm seeing that shift a little bit. It's not universal, but it is there. Is anyone else seeing that shift in leadership? What the answer is sometimes? Yes, this is both the frustrating and wonderful thing about working with people. Progress isn't linear. You see sparks of progress and then things backslide for a little bit and then you go forward. It's like waves. The main thing is to, I think, celebrate when you see those sparks, build upon them, hopefully connect them, and don't lose faith because transformation, I specialize in very short-term engagements where it's 90 days, which is aggressively short on purpose. Um, what I'm hoping to do in those 90 days is connect enough dots so that they have something they can build on for the next year or two. And then I come back and connect some more dots. So all of these transformations, it takes a while for it to become the new normal. And we have to allow that space because that's what the cognitive level means. We're not just rushing people through implementing practices. We're giving them the time to internalize this in the context of what they already know, the way they think, who they are. And that's how it becomes real. And there's a lot that we can do to encourage that, but we can't force it. It's, it's like I said, inconvenient reality of human beings and systems. They have their own lifespan and we have to allow for that. Um, okay, so that's, if you're just doing agile, at the team level, that's great. It's still a really good thing. And these four things will help you do that and make it stick and do it well and make it work for those who are working in it, I hope. But I want to go back to the second point about there's something deeper that drew us to Agile. That value, that sense of community, sense of changing and making it better for everybody. And yeah, I'm, that's what drew me to Agile, right? The Scrum is awesome. I love doing it. But the intention always was, oh my gosh, here's the thing that we can actually make a better world. And there are places in the adult community that I go to to get refreshed. And so I think these values are there. So how do we make these values the dominant voice in agile is really where I want to go to. And for me, it's these four concepts. I mentioned earlier, I come from Lean. And what that does for me is gives me a background in the deeper context, I think. Because like I said, Scrum started out with solving problem software development. Lean was looking very much at like, what is the purpose of an organization? How do we make all of these thousands of people work together? What is this? And I'm so lucky that I got introduced to system thinking at a very, very early age. Um, my, my second job at a college was in system thinking. I was like, wait, what is this? It's not a new concept. It dates back to 1970s, which is what, 50 years now? Wow. Um, but it is so true. And as I noticed, Google search history, every 12, 14 years, there's an uptick in system thinking. People keep going back to this for a reason. And all system thinking really is, is it's recognizing that events and people and things do not happen in isolation. They're part of a bigger context. Again, background in healthcare. Healthcare is the ultimate system thinking. You can't diagnose and fix people by just fixing symptoms. They're part of a body. You have to treat that body. You treat the mind that goes to the body and the family the body is attached to. It's all of these bigger things. The other element of system thinking is when you're changing one part of a system, other parts are going to respond. They're going to change, not necessarily in ways that you can predict. The standard medical analogy is if you prescribe medicine, there are going to be other side effects. That's standard system thinking. And that applies in organizations too. And I love this iceberg example of system thinking and organization because what most of us look at are events and we react and we fix it. And if we're very lucky, we go into patterns so that we can anticipate and do some of that work, great. But very rarely do we get into the design and transform stages because that's looking at the underlying structures of an organization. What is built into this organizational DNA where these patterns keep recurring? What are the root causes? 
root cause analysis is a very standard lean technique. Fishbone diagram, all these tools existed. They exist to get to this level, but they're hard. And they're not necessarily easy template. It takes time to do these, which is why they don't get used very often. But I'm a huge fan of fishbone diagrams, and I do use them a lot because they contextualize what is happening, allow us to connect the dots and to change it. And I'm seeing a question, how can leaders encourage more diversity thought? I will come back to that in just a moment. The last part I mentioned cognitive, this is the mental models. This is how we see the world. Am I seeing the same thing you're seeing? If we can't talk to that level, we're not gonna be able to transform. So there's value at every step, but to get to the maximum value, you do have to be able to go to the transform level, which is cognitive mental model. And to do that, system thinking is essential. I don't know of a way to do this in organizations without understanding system thinking. Okay. The second part of this is focusing on outcomes. And this comes back to the how not why. Again, when leadership says they want agile, why? What is the problem you're trying to solve? What will change? And the reason this is important is that, yes, it's a North Star, all of those things, great. But the, I'm pretty pragmatic in what I mean by agile. So what is this, why is this really important? For me, it's this. When leadership can clearly articulate the why, other people can come up with the how. So by that, I mean, we used to say a leader comes in with a vision, everybody else has cemented. it. That honestly is outdated because the challenges that we have these days are too complex for any one person to own the, all the answers. And I'll talk about them more in detail, but the best way I know how leaders can facilitate agile transformation, innovation, strategic planning, any other business outcome that you want to consider is by focusing on the why. The way I talk to my clients is, in any work, there are two groups of people, somebody who owns the why, somebody who can prioritize the what, and a different group who owns the how. And if you're thinking about basic agile transformation, the product owner prioritizes the what and the why. The teams own the how. Take that same concept and make it bigger in every organization. Leadership can really drill down on the why. They can prioritize the what, but they have to let go of the how. The people doing the work will know best how to do it. And they can experiment and try with the how without losing track of the why. And when you have leadership that gets too deep into the how, you stifle people. You stifle their expert knowledge. Because this is a hard thing for a lot of leaders to realize, I think. They were the experts on something, but they've been promoted. And they don't have that day-to-day -day immersion of that expertise anymore. Somebody else has that job. You have to let them do their job. You can't try to have it both ways. So the language I use is leaders own the why and the what, let go of the how, so your teams can experiment and try and tell you what works best. This has to be co-created. You can't have one group or one party doing all of this. The way I typically say that is everybody knows something no one else knows. So if we can put that collective wisdom together, we're going to have better outcomes. And one of the key points of this way of thinking is going broad before you go deep. And that is try to find the end-to-end -end thin thread, the MVP, whatever you want to call it, the core value stream before trying to nail down each practice and making it perfect. Because all of those practices are going to change. Okay, so I'm seeing a couple of questions. Okay. Good way for leaders and teams to ask the why? Lots of different things. Um, Simon Sinek has written a series of really good books on this concept. Start with why, find your why. There's a, some incredible ideas and concepts from his books, and I use a lot of it. The other thing is really ask. Just start the conversations. Take notes. And most leaders I know, especially now, they're juggling a million different things. They go into this meeting, another meeting, and by the end of the day, it's like, um, I was in eight meetings, what did I do take? So part of our value as being change agents or catalysts, and you can be this without having any role, by the way, specific role is, 
constantly ask why. Why are we doing this? Who are we benefiting? Have we talked to people who say we're going to help? Have we done that? Constantly keeping that focus because we're human and we're going to lose focus. This is the reality of life. So going back to think and taking notes and remembering and serving as the conscience of your team and your organization is a really high value proposition. Saying, you know, last time we talked about this is why. Are we still doing that? Are we changing? It's great to change and respond and react. But when we shift, let's recognize that we shifted so that everybody else is now on the new page that we're in. Uh, a comment from Laura, when leaders manage, yes, the team loses the focus of the why and the creative problems solve the energy as well. Yes. And also just basic reality. I work with inflation security groups these days. The technology is too complex for any one person to have the answers. There's new options every few weeks, new tools, new approaches. And if you make the how too static or make the how owned by leadership, the feedback loops are simply not going to happen fast enough to respond to the threats that we're facing. So I work with U.S. government agencies. Solar wind is a very, very real thing that we dealt with at work. And one of the things that my client decided was, wait, we can't have leadership groups responding to solar wind. We don't have enough capacity to do that at that level. We're going to have to delegate it to teams and then have leaders connect the dots on those. So hopefully all of this is making sense. Um, and this goes back to the people part, right? Cognitive biases. We, we don't have a necessarily good language to talk about what we see and what we think as individuals. We tend to think that, oh, this is so obvious. Of course, we're all seeing the same way. Not in my experience. Mm -hmm. Cognitive biases are basically mental shortcuts that our brain takes to make it easier to process information. A lot of this is anthropological. Things that work for us in millennia, do they still work for us? Maybe not. But if we don't know what those shortcuts are, how do we change them? I really wish we would teach kids what mental models are. Let them understand their own mental models. Because in order to make group work possible, especially in solving complex problems, we have to be able to share our mental models. Do you see what I do? Are you seeing something different? Are we looking at the same thing, calling it two different things? These are the kind of conversations we need to have, but we don't have the robust vocabulary and practice to do so. Can we compare our perceptions and perspectives? So that when we make decisions, they're based on shared reality and not on one person's perception. So everybody else feels ignored. And to make this happen, we have to acknowledge identities, race, gender, ethnicity, class, educational background, the world we grew up in, culture, all of these things that are awkward and painful and difficult and problematic. But we're gonna have to have those challenge conversations because if we don't have identity, we're not gonna get to cognitive biases. Because what we see, believe, and value is based on our identity, all of our identities. And if we can't bring that to the table, we're never going to get to the cognitive level to truly transform. I am not saying this so easy. Um, this is incredibly challenging, and organizations reflect the broader world. And since I'm American, I can tell you that my world is really crazy right now and has been for the past couple of years. Um, I was actually coaching a government agency in the election in November after that, and the first day back, we're having a big meeting, I was facilitating, I'm like, how do I not acknowledge the elephant in the room? Like, we just went through a very, very painful election, we still don't know the results, half our country is horrified, either way, so I basically did, instead of doing a traditional warm-up, we started something I call the adult story, but it was once upon a time, and then each person adds a word, and you just sort of loosely connect the dots. It's a good way of bringing out what's buried. We ended up with evil politicians and all kinds of concepts. And it took five minutes. And did we fix anything? No. But we at least acknowledged that there is this thing that impacts all of us, especially from federal government. And these are things that are going to impact us. And at a later time, we can really have conversations on that. But I at least wanted to not ignore the obvious because I'm sure every person in that room 
half of their mind was on the election results. Because mine was, I was having a hard time concentrating. So, and very much connected to this is this idea that when I first started doing adult transformations, I was a scrum master and I perceived it as a series of hurdles. We're a relay team, this is a hurdle race, we have to jump through these hurdles, we're gonna get to the end, we're gonna win. It's an easy race, we know exactly what this is. That was my mental model for a scrum team. And when I became an agile coach, I failed that mental model. Of course, bigger hurdles, more hurdles, different teams running at different speed, but still the same course, right? Not so much. Agile transformation is what I call a wicked problem. Does anyone familiar, is anyone familiar with wicked problems and what they mean? We can jump in, anyone who wants to. Laura, I think you know exactly what this is. Do you want to jump in with your answer? I am. Um, let me see. I think I'm. No, I'm not muted. Uh, I, I. Well, I'm afraid of being wrong, but I, wicked problems are things that look like one thing and they're actually something else. It's, there's a deeper thing going on than what it, it's got bigger roots and tentacles and they creep up from behind and grab you when you're not looking. So. All of that. And yes. So wicked problems are really societal problems that are interdependent. They have multiple causes, multiple impacts. They require changes in individual and group behavior. They have unforeseen consequences. Multiple stakeholders with competing priorities. Previous failures. Does this sound familiar? Like this is an agile transformation. And it really changes how and what you can do when you shift the mental model of an agile transformation from a series of hurdles to be run at the team level to this very complex dynamic that needs to be managed, that is going to be coming up in different ways and it's going to blindside you. And, and that's, that's if you're done well. Like it's not that agile, the wicked problem is not done well. Even if you're having the world's best agile transformation, it is still a wicked problem. It's just the reality of human beings and wicked problems require a very different approach to problem solving. It's all of these concepts that we covered so far and a whole lot more. So I've been calling this wicked agility as a way of explaining why we do this because when I work with my clients, I honestly don't talk about Scrum or Agile all that much. It's people, it's problem, it's how are we doing, what are we doing, what's not working. So what I've been doing for the past two weeks is trying to put into one slide all of these different conversations I've been having over the past few years. So. I will apologize in advance, the slide is very, very dense. Um, there's slides explaining each of these concepts in further detail. I will send it to you, but I would like to stay the conversation at this level and please jump in and see if this makes sense. So I start off with the outcome that we want is a healthy ecosystem where it's a win-win scenario for everybody. Because again, the reality of today's organizations and challenges is we're not on an island. Vendors, suppliers, I mean, hello, the last one here, supply chain challenges, the chart is this. No matter how strong we are, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And we've got to be able to look and talk about all the third parties. From a limited cybersecurity sense, most cybersecurity threats come from third parties. Like all of this stuff is a reality. So how do we respond to this goal of having a healthy ecosystem? The first one to me is orchestration. Again, it's not one person with an answer, a coach or a CEO or whoever. It's letting everybody play. Everybody has to play to be part of this. But there has to be some sense of orchestration. What are we playing? Are we all on the same page? Can we hear each other? Are we listening to each other? Is there some way of enabling us to hear and each other because we have to respond to what we hear, not just we're off on our own tangent. It's, it's interdependent, right? So there has to be some degree of orchestration. There has to be a way of visualizing the invisible. Um, there's this concept called the um, God, the iceberg, something, I'm forgetting drawing blank of the name, but basically says the higher up you go in an organization, the less you know about the problems in the organization. And I found this to be true in pretty much every industry. So we have to be able to visualize that. 
a very brief way I do that by clients is everything we do, we call it initiatives, the name changes. It has to be categorized as running the business, growing the business, or transforming the business. When we do this, what happens is most of what leadership sees and tracks is in transforming and maybe growing new products, new customers, innovation, because that's what they care about. And they lose track that the 70% of their people's time is spent on running the business. This gives leaders a very distorted sense of, of capabilities. And they get frustrated. Why are we not being more innovative? Well, because you thought you had 100% of eight people's time. You actually have 25% of the time because they're doing all the other stuff that you forgot. Yes, Mario, you're right. Gartner's framework of run, transform, grow. Yes, that's what I use. Thank you for giving credit. Yes. So basically, we put a field in JIRA that says you have to track everything as run, grow, transform. And that, so that every group is able to say to their leadership, right now we're 80% in running the business because that's kind of what it has to be. Here's your capacity for running and growing. What do you want it to prioritize? And when leadership says, no, we want more here, okay, what do we take off in running the business? Do we stop doing some things? Do we hand off certain other people? Or do we invest in automating some of these things so that we can make more room for running, uh, for transforming and growing? There are options, but we have to talk about this. And I have found running, growing, transforming to be a very understandable shorthand to have all these complex conversations. So however you do it, you have to visualize it invisible. Reality check. And when you do this, you get co-created alignment. Again, nobody owns this. It has to be co-created. So leadership says, here's my priority. We come back and think, great. Here's your other 48 things you want us to do. Do you want to change my job description so I can focus on your priority? If not, like, this is what you're going to get. It's being able to have those. And it doesn't have to be controversial. It just has to be real. Like, I get this your priority, so can we not do X, Y, and Z for this one year so we can do this and pick it up next year? Let's have this conversation, which leads us very nicely into elephants in the room. Every organization has them. And good leaders, whether it's coaches or managers or C-suite individuals, we know what these are. We have to model making it okay to talk about these and to do something about it. In government, um, the most often elephant in the room is, when adult fund started off, we thought product owners and teams two equally, what's the word, um, equal amount of power balancing. Yeah, that's not true in government ever. You have contractors and federal employers who are never gonna be on the same power level. That's the elephant in the room for doing adult transformation in government. You have to talk about that. You have to adjust Agile framework to recognize that reality. So what are the elephants in the room? It is whose voice is heard, who's in the decision-making loop. Are we talking about failures? Are we saying innovate, but um, the people who did the, something big and it didn't work, they're not punished and don't have a voice in the conversation? Hypocrisy, that's an elephant in the room. Any time where we converge from what we're saying to what we do, any gaps between our values and our actions, those are elephants in the room. And the question earlier about how do leaders make room for all this stuff, it's this. This is what leaders can do and they should do. Name the behavior. I literally actually ordered pink elephants for a client. And anybody who saw this, put the elephant on the table, and they got, with a couple of golden hours, everybody earned some time to try their own experiment. Every time somebody bought up a pink elephant, they got a golden hour. It's reinforcing behavior. Okay. The reality of any business effort these days, it's, it's less about problem solving and more about what I call balancing polarities, and that means shifting from either or to yes and. We have to do this and we have to do this and this and this. Like that's just, that is a reality that I'm seeing everywhere. I don't know that, again, complex organizations don't have simple problems. 
we don't get to say, yeah, we'll do this and anything else that happens, the byproduct, oh, no big deal. That's not how this works. It's the two industries I've worked most in are healthcare and cybersecurity. And you can't say, well, I've cured cancer, but I've killed the patient. Like, that's not a thing you can do. You have to. So I'm calling it balancing polarity. And the, if you're balancing polarities, you have to deal with conflict. The world doesn't work in a way where we can do one, two, and three and still do everything else. We have to say no to some things. We have to say no to some people. We have to be able to shift perspectives and priorities and, and manage all the conflict that comes with it. This goes back to elephant in the room. You can't hide this. This has to be open. We have to have the conversations about trade-offs. About, I know it feels like you're not winning right now, but we have to invest and we'll come back to you. I know you don't agree, but right now I'm prioritizing this. But let's talk about the consequences and impact on you so I can help you mitigate this. These are all the kind of conversations we have to be having. Because you have to have situational awareness. Yes, the healthy ecosystem is the goal. But well, where are you now in relation to that? Is the choices that you're making today, are they impacting your ultimate outcome of healthy ecosystems? Sometimes this happens. You have to take a short-term pain. But recognize that, hey, I'm taking a hit on people's trust to do this. I'm going to earn back their trust. These are all trade-offs. This is balancing what it looks like. Sometimes we're going to be hypocrites. It comes to the territory. But acknowledge that and say, yes, normally I'm all about transparency, but I'm going to hide this one thing here because for this reason, I promise I'll come back to this. Most people are going to respond better when we call out all of the stuff. Um, the last couple concepts are, I'm calling you the edge of unknown, because if you're doing all these things right, it's going to change in six months, in a year. And, and that's the new reality. We're always going to be on the edge of our comfort zone individually and as an organization. How do we make it okay? It's the high trust environment, psychological safety. It's being able to adjust. Okay, right now, run door transform is working wonderfully to visualize it invisible. What if it doesn't? How do we know it's not working? How do we influence something else? It's all of this experimentation because when you're always the facing new challenges, what worked for the last two months suddenly stopped working? You're like, but why? This was working so well. What happened? People changed. Things changed. Situation changed. A key person left. Some other priority happened. So, okay, what can we try? So, because there's a lot packed into the slide, and I'm happy to some along the slides that will deconstruct all of this. Um, so the question I'm getting is, which one or do they struggle most? These are all connected together. And, and that's what I would go back to. This is not, you can't just do one of these things. Balance and polarity, you have to do all of these things. Sometimes you'll do better others than other times, but you have to keep all of these factors. What I would probably say is understanding what orchestration means. I think organizations really have a challenge with that. Because it's not automation. It's not, let me jump to that slide to talk about that because that's kind of a little bit. Coaching is not orchestration by itself. It's something more. It's not, it's not automation either. It's the best way to describe what I mean by orchestration is proactively designing systems and processes to ensure that everyone's voice is heard and everyone else is reacting based on what they have heard and validated. This isn't simply a management thing. This is a cultural thing. It's people, it's processes, and you have to continually prioritize this. So I will never say, you know, if you do one, ignore all the other, it doesn't work. But if I had to pick one that's the hardest orchestration, and that's why it's first. It's this is a practice that we've got to build. We have to start with this. Okay, so this has been me talking for about 45 minutes, so I really want to stop now and give you all a chance to 
does this resonate? What am I missing? What should be on here? What is something that doesn't translate? Um, I have one question, um, because uh, sometimes I also present about Agile, uh, uh, for example, to a management team. And uh, last time, well, what I experienced when you used the word agility, um, a lot of different functions, they claim they uh, contribute the most to agility. Uh, so you have some like, uh, uh, they, they feel like offended when you say that uh, uh, if you talk about agility and uh, that there's a framework, how to use it. Um, so how can you scope agility or agile or yeah, in, in those sessions? So the way I usually phrase this is lots of groups and organizations are doing things that fit into the agile world. They just might not be calling it what we call it. Anything that anything that amplifies people working together and learning, that's agile. So to me, the way I typically do it is, yes, everyone's agile. Great. What are all the agile things you're doing? Let's identify all those good things. This is what agile means in this organization. I am not a big framework person. Um, because Frameworks work until they don't work because they're all dependent on the reality, right? So I would say this, let's look at what we're doing that fits into the agile values and let's call this our way towards agility. Let's build upon those, celebrate those things they're doing well, and then let's pick a few things to bridge the gap, to connect the dots. Hey, we're doing all these things really well, but you know, we're not really learning from these great things. How do we learn from this? Can we add one new practice that connects the dots to what we're already doing? So it's a practice I call subway mapping. Um, and I'm happy to send you uh, what I do for subway mapping. The basic concept is in New York City or London, there's a huge subway system that most of us will never ever, like I don't know anybody who got through every station and every line of any of these subway systems, but they're there. They help us navigate all this. But what, all, what we do is, where am I in London? What stations do I want to go to? Which line do I need to know about? I will discover other lines only when I need them example I use in New York, if you're visiting New York for the first time, you probably want to do Penn Station, Broadway, World Trade Center. Okay, all you really need to know is lines A and C, and here are the four stations you don't ignore the rest because they don't matter for you. Okay, now you understand your liberty. Hold on, let me show you two other lines because you need to know different things now. You want to go to Brooklyn? Okay, let's add more lines in. It's the knowledge is there, but Give people what they need when they need it. Show them how to connect the dots. Does that remotely answer your question? Well, do I have to see those uh, that subway map as like all the agile aspects you can touch, or more how the organization looks like? No, it's more about the traditional subway map has a million agile practices, right? So what I do with subway map is which stations and which lines do you want for this organization? No organization ever is going to do all the six million agile practices. Mm -hmm. What are the three that we can start off with? What are the dozen that we can incorporate into our DNA? Organizational capacity is really, really limited. Remember, what we're doing for agile or innovation or anything, it's happening on top of the regular business work, all the other things they're doing. So successful transformations to me are very thin sliced. It's what are the, I have never had a transformation that used more than a dozen other practices. Like a dozen is really about the top that you can realistically do. Some might be in three and a dozen, but finding the right practices and the right way to the practices that amplifies everything else, to me, that's the secret sauce that there is one. So it's like helpful for experimenting on the agile practices within an organization uh, to pick and choose or very much so. So, full disclosure, um, I, I said I don't like frameworks. I'm not a fan of SAFE. Um, I, <laughs> I, I refuse to do SAFE. So, to me, it's about understanding the options mm -hmm. and selecting the options that are going to work in this place for this, these group of people. Let's try three practices. Okay, let's say we do um, retrospective because that's always my favorite. Um, and let's say we do a shared backlog, and let's say we do run, grow, transform. 
those are three practices we're going to start off with right now. For the next 30 days, let's try those three things. Let's see how it works. Is this helping? If it's helping, keep those. Maybe add one more practice. If something is not particularly adding value, pull it out for now. Like one of the hardest things for me was stopping retros. Because I love retros and I believe in them fundamentally. But for a particular group, they did not see value every two weeks. And we tried different retro templates. They're just like, okay, Layla, I mean, this is fun, but this is not really helping us right now. So we stopped doing retros, which horrified the adult push part of me. But we move retros from every two weeks to every quarter. That's what worked for them. We got more value. So to do this well, you really do have to have that broader knowledge, have lots of options, find ways to simplify those things in slice, right? The MVP, we call it. Um, do a simple version of run, grow, transform. Like, what does it look like? Let people get used to it. Let them build their comfort zone. And you figure out very quickly, do they love it or not? Because when you hit the right three practices, the buy-in is enormous. And if you identify the first three that are right or you change them, you get so much buy-in. And at least the way, when I do this, I don't get resistance because I'm not selling them something. They're choosing with me. Again, they own the why and the what, I own the how. Yes, right? thanks. So I design, yes. Okay, so younger generation. So the good thing is, and this goes back to a lot of work I do with Leo. We work with girls and younger women. I think they know this. Most of us intuitively know and value these things. Our education system and our work system have drained us away from our instincts towards these abilities. So I think a lot of this is tapping into our innate instincts and values, but showing a lightweight way to get there. So we all will nod our heads, yeah, the elf is in the room. Okay, great, we can solve that. What is a really simple way to make those elephants visible? But I use a little toy, like whatever. What, what's the simple thing you can do? And I think that's where my bias against frameworks and safe comes from. The best answer to complexity is not more complexity. It's emergence, it's simplicity. Try something small, see how it works. Let's let the answers bubble up. They will. If you build the right culture and you have the right people, the right answers will bubble up. You experiment the right things. Like, aha, you'll get that moment. That becomes your new norm. It doesn't have to be uphill battles. It can be fun. Like if you're, so I do this in, in 90 days and this is how I do it. I don't have a framework in mind. Now, um, I will say this, but those of you who like frameworks, this is, Ouch, sounds a little bit too hard. Okay, this is the closest thing I have to framework. Um, this is called Accomplished Fragility, the book that Jade referenced earlier. This is how I do all of those. Now, I will never ever say, please do this. Find your own, okay? But this is kind of how I do it. The way it works is we always start off with ideation. This is the why. What is the problem we're trying to go towards? What's the outcome? The step, circle of the steps, the band, whatever these things are, are the techniques. So the what and the how. So you have to do the how, but you can choose what. So every client can choose which technique they want to do, small, medium, large. Small is a half a day, medium is a full day, large is two days, typically for complex organizations. Your mileage will vary. So what I will say is for any client to work with me, you're going to do this because this is the best way I know how to do this. Now, most clients want to jump into the inaction. Let's fix this problem. Okay, like, hey, before we fix it, let's figure out what problem we're fixing. Let's make sure it's the right problem. So the way I get buy-in is I need at minimum a day and a half before we can jump into what you want. And usually I get a day and a half. That's not asking for a lot. More accurately, it becomes a week. So we spend a week going through the first three steps before diving into the actual doing. This takes typically about a month, three weeks-ish. Then we do introspection, we come back. So I typically do three iterations every quarter and we figure out what is the outcome. Sometimes we pivot outcome because, oh wait, that's symptom, not the root cause. But generally speaking, this is how I work. And all of the things we talked about fit into this framework for me. You can 
seriously create your own framework. Figure out what works for you because you're different. Your culture, your organizations are going to be unique. This is a shorthand I use, and I turned it into a, a book and a framework just because I got tired of being told, you can't possibly do Agile in 90 days. Like, I'm doing it. I've been doing this for seven years. And I don't work in Silicon Valley startups. I work in D.C., which is politics and things designed not to work. And this still works there. So if this works for you, I'm happy to walk you through it. But I'm less concerned about the how and more about the why. So I think it's the principles that matter a whole lot more. If you're doing these things, this to me is going to be more useful than the compass. The compass is a shortcut. If it works for you, great, use it. If it doesn't work for you, don't use it. But these, these values, I would say, are universal. Okay, I think we're out of time. Yes, thank you, Leila, so much. I feel like they, you've got some brilliant concepts here and they're really tangible. Um, so moving towards being more agile as a team, as an, as an organization as well. So thank you so much for sharing those. And I think kindly, Leila has said she'll have better slides with us. Um, so we can distribute them to everyone who's attended today. We'd love to hear what you thought about today's session and just sharing a link to our feedback form. Um, so please do fill that out and tell us what you thought. And yeah, I thank you again, Leila. That was a brilliant session. Thank you to everyone who contributed and asked questions. And yeah, I hope you have a lovely rest of your day.